I'm there we go, recording in progress. I'm going to share, I'm going to share my screen. And if all works well, you should see me in the corner of it and a slide in the top. So let me just do that. And then where's my Zoom gone? Uh, let me go share screen. That's the desktop I want to share. Okay, can everyone now see a slide with me in the bottom right hand corner? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So today I'm introducing you to the Numberella Brain Training book series. Uh, in this slide here, you can see the first part of that series. These are what are called the Antonio books. And there are four levels currently in print, level zero, level one, level two, and level three. Level zero is the one you can see at the bottom there with the blue roundel on the front. And that is a five question per set uh, book, which encompasses number bonds to five and number bonds to 10. So you'd use this book with uh, children probably from four or five once they can begin to start writing numbers and you're using it to strengthen their hand and to get them familiar with you know counting up to five um, and subsequently to ten and five and ten are very useful of course because we have five fingers on one hand or four fingers and a thumb but generally we're just going to say five fingers and, and ten fingers on both hands so it's a, a fairly intuitive place to start when children are learning counting and so the purpose of the book is to sort of transfer the knowledge from the physical uh, into the written and get them used to making those shapes, which as adults, we've come to understand as numbers. Uh, then the range goes up to level one, which has the yellow front, level two, which has the green front, and level three, which has the pink front. And level one has 10 questions, level two has 20, and level three has 30. And the idea is that we increase the number of questions to begin to stretch a concentration span and concentration stamina. Um, and by the time we get to level three, we start doing things like reversing the order of flow. So instead of starting at the top, we'll start at the bottom. From the, uh, the Antonio range, which is what you see here, we go into the Tiger range. I'm not gonna dwell on the Tiger range today. The principles extend through the whole range. Um, so that's just a, a quick snapshot of, of what, what the range looks like. Um, now, before getting into the nitty gritty of the books, I'm going to talk a little bit about where the need for them comes from. Um, maths is a, a, a subject which is quite unique in the sense that uh, it very rapidly disperses students into different camps. Um, a few, a lucky few, will find numbers quite easy and quite intuitive. They'll grasp them quickly uh, in class and will sort of distinguish themselves, distill themselves to the top of um, the food chain in the classroom. Uh, for those that are not in that group, numbers can create fear and that fear can lead to loathing. Um, and quite often when we're called in to support uh, children in maths, this will be their position uh, relative to the subject. And they will have got there because all children, no matter how, how much schools and teachers seek to disguise relative achievement, children are very aware of relative achievement. Okay, they, they know that someone else knows something faster than them. This might be because someone's putting their hand up first. But I think you, you just know as a learner when, when other people are catching on to things more quickly. And of course, you don't like that. Right? Nobody likes to lose. It's one of the things I've learned in, in teaching and especially gamified teaching is that Everybody likes to win. Everybody prefers to win. And people are generally pretty disappointed and sometimes even angry when they lose. And so in children, these very strong emotions can cause them to turn off the subject. Uh, and maths is often a, vic a victim of this sort of chain of events. Now, of course, no matter how you dress it up, if you're not doing well at something relative to others, your self-esteem suffers. You wanted to do well at it. I don't think anyone sets out in anything wanting to do badly. Uh, we all hope that we can do well and, and, and aspire to do well. And if that doesn't happen, and in a class of 
25 to 30 kids, it's inevitable that the majority will be, relatively speaking, failing compared to the top group, okay? They're conscious of that. So what happens? Their, their self-esteem suffers. Um, and quite often, maths is a subject which is dragging down a student um, in, in terms of their, their overall self-awareness, their overall self-esteem. And of course, this can begin to impact their performance at school. Um, you know, any, any subject which is where, where you're underperforming relative to other people can um, sort of damage your school experience, if you like. And you know, the, the perfect situation is where everybody finds everything reasonably easy and enjoyable. And of, of course, the, the, the realities of education where you have big groups of children and not many teachers is that uh, that doesn't happen for the majority. And actually, as tutors, our role is to come in and, um, and try and address that balance a little bit. And, you know, for many students for whom flight has been the option, um, the support that uh, they can be brought by tutors is, um, is, is very, very important. Now, as at the same time that we're learning numbers, we are, of course, learning letters. Now, letters get a lot more uh, repetition than numbers. We, we hear words all the time. We desperately want to communicate. If you look at little children, toddlers and you know, two, two and three year olds, Trying to speak is, is what their you know is, is their, their main objective, and so numbers tend to come second in this um, race for cognition. Um, and what that manifests as when we get into the math space is we start getting things called word problems, um, which you know are another step harder than merely adding numbers together or multiplying numbers because we're having to combine these two knowledge spaces, the words and the numbers, and Words typically come more quickly, certainly spoken words. Reading is a slightly different thing because you can have dyslexia and you can have you know, some children catching on to reading faster than others. But generally, uh, there's you know, more emphasis uh, placed upon it. And obviously, we're speaking and listening all the time. So when children look at these word questions, um, the numbers can just simply add too much to the brain load, to the processing requirement. and so. One of the things that we want to try and do is take the number processing out of the equation. We're trying to get to a point where the numbers start to take care of themselves. In other words, you don't think about what the answer might be or think about how to get the answer. That answer just starts to occur to you. Um, and this is the state that we call fluency. It's the, the place where we stop having to think about um, what we're doing. All right, now everyone knows what fluency is because we're all doing it now. You're listening to me and you're not really having to try and understand what I'm saying. Uh, and when I speak to you, I'm, there's some kind of formulation process going on in my head, but basically the speaking bit is easy. I'm not having to think too hard about anything that I'm doing. And so we're all familiar with fluency when it comes to speaking and listening, but um, in, when it comes to numbers, that is generally not there. Even as adults, we have a very so we have a small amount of fluency in numbers. We can you know, we can probably all count to ten pretty fluently without thinking about it. We can probably count in ones as adults up to a hundred without thinking about it too much. But as soon as we start to add complexity, like if I asked Bargis to count in fourteens, for example, he um, might not be able to do that. Um, without a little bit of thought, you know, and, and I don't think anybody could, probably me too, you know, you'd have to think about it. Um, but for children, this numerical fluency isn't a given. And generally, I find that in children, although they can count in ones up to 10, as soon as you get it and start getting them to count in twos or threes or fours, things start to break down. Generally, children can get to 12 in twos, and that's when they'll first hesitate. So, you know, the fluency has a pretty low threshold when you think of it compared to uh, speech, right, where fluency is pretty much there from, you know, maybe the age of three or four, depending on the child. All right. So you can see on the slide here, I put word turnover is greater than number turnover. We do a lot more speaking than we do multiple, so going through multiple streams, generally getting our fluency in numbers up. And so what happens when we change that? What happens when we increase the amount of times that we start going through numbers? And the answer, of course, is they start to 
get more uh, get more fluent and uh, we start to do them more easily so what is fluency what does that mean in terms of how many calculations do we have to do per second is this just a little guideline um in the uh, level one and level two books of the Numberella series, uh, one question per two seconds is the, the mark that we're looking at. It's when things, if you're watching a child completing the book, it's when things start to look like they're flowing, right? When they stop having to, they, they don't stop at a number, think about it for a little bit and then write it down. The answer just seemed to flow out of their pencil. And that happens at about one question every two seconds. And as we move up the range, the requirement goes up as well. And you may find very, very occasionally uh, that um, someone can get up to about two questions per second, but it's unusual in a student. My own personal best for 20 questions is, is about 9.8 seconds. Um, and I, I don't think it's uh, really possible to go much faster because you can't physically write any faster than that. Students can generally get to one question per second. And I've, I've known some students get down to about um, 14 seconds for 20 questions. And when you can move that quickly, uh, it, it's really a, a game changer. Uh, OK, we come on to some some specifics on the books and what they do. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments at that point? Um, no, not really. All good. OK. All right, so on I roll. So what you're looking at here is uh, the level one number bonds to 10 book. Um, and the number of the books are designed to facilitate what we call three-way learning, processing speed, confidence, and growth mindset. And I'll get into those uh, shortly. All books come with a sticker pack. So you have uh, gold, silver, and bronze stickers. And then at the bottom, you have the ant sticker, which is the highest award you can get in the book and that's the one when you are beginning to get towards the fluency mark uh, on the left of those stickers you have the personal best and goal achieved stickers and they are there to recognize when a student has achieved a personal best by which we simply mean the fastest they've ever gone in that particular exercise style and when they've achieved their goal um, and this motivational structure motivational architecture is really central to the, the way that these books work. Um, now, here's an example of one of the pages in the books. And what you can see is that uh, this question page is set out that it has um, something plus six equals 10. So we're required to put the first part of the uh, equation as the answer. Um, and you can also see that you have your in your medals and prizes section, you have your ant, your gold, your silver, and your bronze. And before you start an exercise, you circle whatever your goal is. Uh, at the top, you have your date, and you might be able to see that it says dates to qualify for bonus. So it's very important to get in some kind of um, a ritual before starting the exercise. So I like students to, to answer the date. I find young children very rarely know the date. Uh, and it helps begin to allow them to place themselves within space and time, start to sort of understand where they are in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, we're 4.6 billion years into uh, existence so far as we know. Um, so our modern dating system is somewhat misleading in that sense, because, of course, 2,000 years is, is, is the blink of an eye in the context of the history of the universe. So. Um, you know, quite how useful that is as a dating system is, is it's a different discussion. <laughs> but anyway, I like them to know what the date is. Um, and if they remember that, then they are eligible for their bonus. And you can see written in the small, small print, it says circle your goal, fill in the numbers in the A column. If you write the date and get 100%, you get a two second bonus. Okay, so uh, getting 100%, right? That is a really important objective. It's customary to accept, you know, in education, we, we sort of accept maybe 70% as being quite a good mark. Um, and, and in some ways it is, but I can't help feeling that if 
we're leaving 30% behind. Um, we're not really sort of serving the student properly. We should be aspiring that you know everybody can get 100%, um, which is why I, I, I bring this into these books. Um, so you do get a time bonus if you get 100%, and that's the aspiration. Um, then you can see we've got um, hand speed, we've got bonus, and we've got total time. So hand speed means how fast do you get through it? Your bonus is if you get your 100%, and then your total time is your, your adjusted time after that bonus has been applied if you get it. Okay, so that's the basic setup of the books. And you can see here, there's a little example of each page. So you've got your A type, which is the one I just described, and then your B type where you write the uh, answer in the middle column. So you can see 10 plus something is 10, or three plus something is 10. And then you have your C type, which is generally what people are more familiar with. Two plus four equals something. That's the format that we answer most frequently. And then you have your medley, which is where we mix up these types. So you get used to doing one, then another, then another, then another. And what this does is when you practice all of this together, is it gives you um, a, a malleable, flexible, and robust arithmetic. So that if the order of things is changed around, it doesn't come as a surprise. Children are used to it. And of course, that means um, in, the, uh, in the pressure of an exam, they're less likely to get thrown by something there, you know, by, by a presentation of a sum that they otherwise might be unfamiliar with. Okay. Um, now, a little bit on goal setting. When we set a goal for ourselves, we frame our actions with that goal. So we give ourselves a sense of purpose uh, to what we're doing. And that's an incredibly valuable habit to get into. So prior to commencing any exercise, we get the children to set their goal. So it just sort of sets it up. It makes it an event. It makes it something, um, it gives them something to, to aim at, basically. Um, and that's a very important habit to get into uh, at an early age. It maybe gives us a little bit more determination. Um, we also reward personal best. You can see here we've got where it says Antonio, we've got space for a personal best sticker. And we've got space for a goal sticker. Now, a personal best is something which is talked about mainly in athletics. Um, I've got a, a sporting background. Um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was quite into various sports. And so personal bests are a big thing. Um, and really what the personal best gives you is a motivational vocabulary. Um, it's a very powerful thing to say to somebody, you are currently the best you've ever been. Um, it really, it really pinpoints what it means to evolve as a human being, right? I don't know, you know, if, if we can talk about um, one particular purpose in living, you could say it's to be happy, and, um, to be rich. Those things don't always go together, of course. Um, but personally, I think it's about evolution of self, right? We we should be striving to be the best we can be at, at whatever it is that we do. And so in this fairly simple practice, we're giving children a window on that aspiration. And of course, once you start talking in those terms, it starts to open up the idea in their mind that they can continue to get better. They can continue to evolve. That um, achievement, that uh, ability is not something that you're born with. It's something that you develop through practice. Uh, and determination and so on. So the personal best is an incredibly important metric um, and we reward it with uh, that little sticker. And if we're operating uh, as our, our students as part of a league, then we can also reward it with bonus ant coins. I'm not gonna talk about leagues and things today, but the personal best is a pathway towards um, bonus ant coins when we, when we talk about a, a sort of a gamified learning system. But I'll, I'll get into that a bit more tomorrow. Um, so there we go. That's a completed page. That's what it looks like. Uh, this student uh, did very well. They got all of their answers correct. Um, and you can see they got their two second bonus there, which took them above the gold threshold, uh, not quite up to the ant threshold. So they've got a gold sticker, a personal best and the goal achieved. And you can see there what's known as the mini flush. 
Now, the mini flush is sort of a joke, um, but it's something that I've come to uh, really enjoy doing for students, and students tend to really enjoy it as well. They look forward to getting it. And the mini flush is what you get when you get 100%, you achieve your goal, you get a personal best, and you get a medal. And it's just a nice sort of hand-drawn extra to put on the page. And this whole process of prize giving, of making the student feel special about themselves for what they just did, uh, the, the mini flushes, the icing on the cake. Um, now, what happens when you go through this process uh, again and again, and the students begin to see their times improve, they start to feel things getting easier, um, and they start to believe that they can get that end. Now, I've lost count of the number of students who, when I sit down with them for the first time, and they maybe scrape a bronze, or they don't even get that bronze, they're like, oh man, I'm never going to get an end. This is, you know, how am I, how am I going to do that? And I say, look, you, you're going to see. You're going to get better very quickly. And, um, you know, we're going to look back in this book and you're going to see that once upon a time you got a bronze and um, you'll, you'll remember our conversation and see what I'm talking about. And so what that leads us to as their belief in themselves grows is maximum effort. OK. Generally, when you give someone a challenge they won't go for it 100%, right? They'll tend to hold back a little bit. They'll want to sort of build a familiarity with what they're doing um, before they're willing to expose themselves to the risk of maximum effort. Um, the risk of maximum effort is that if the outcome isn't what you hoped for, you're going to feel disappointed in yourself. And it's a psychological safety net that most people will uh, erect for themselves. Okay, the idea that if we don't quite try our hardest, it won't matter because we had a little bit in reserve. And um, you know, children are no exception to this rule. So when you show someone a pathway to improvement that they can believe in, they begin to give more. And eventually they start trying as hard as they can. And this manifests in various ways, but um, you know, you can hear breathing change. The, the breathing sort of gets a little bit more intense. You they maybe start doing little ticks of sort of folding the page or, or whatever. The point is they're really getting used to trying their absolute maximum. And it's of course when we try our hardest that we develop the most. We learn the best lessons about ourselves, but we also improve our speed. Um, the most when we do that. And so bringing children through this process to the point where they can try their hardest without fear is maybe um, the highest value of this whole process. Because of course, understanding what it means to go as fast as you can and understanding what it means to try your hardest starts to translate into other areas of uh, school life and of life in general. You know, it's sort of opening their eyes to um, their own potential, and also what is necessary to achieve it, which is giving 100%. Which, of course, leads us to growth mindset. Um, does anyone have an idea of what growth mindset is? So growth mindset is the idea that you will get better through practice in a nutshell. It's the opposite of fixed mindset, which is when you believe that you're born with talent and that talent will take you however far it can, but that basically you're limited by your talent. And sometimes uh, kids in the very top level of, of a class, if they've always found something easy, they can actually develop uh, psychological weakness if their um, if their preeminence begins to crack. Right? If other people start to overtake them, they start to think that there's nothing they can do about it, and their fixed mindset can actually cause a crisis. Whereas if you have a growth mindset, which is where you've built self belief through practice and you sort of understand how it is that you've got to where you are, there's a logical process, and you believe in the process. And so you start to believe that there is no limit because ultimately there's no, there's no limit to how 
far we can improve ourselves. And so a growth mindset is an incredibly strong core to have as you um, evolve in life. And that is what the number of brain training books can give a student. This is a, a graph, an improvement graph taken from a book. Um, most of the time, a book, uh, when completed regularly, will deliver a graph that looks a little bit like this. You can see I've taken the average time of the first four uh, sets and the average time of the last four sets, and it delivers uh, over the course of a couple of months a 232% improvement uh, in time. All right. And that's even with that last exercise there, you can see the green line that's that's dropping away a little bit. You know, that might just be a bad day. Um, but even including that time, it's still a, a very significant improvement over time. And there's something about a physical graph, right? There's something about the fact that this is on paper and they, they know that they've been through the book. They did all of the exercises. They got those times. And there's something about the crosses on the page and the lines, which it's just such concrete evidence for them of what they're capable of. And this, this student here is actually hidden under the label, but you know they started off getting over three minutes to do 20 questions and ended up taking, um, you know, their best time here is under 50 seconds. So it's just such a huge improvement. If you think of it in terms of, you know, running a race, you're talking about your old self versus your new self. So when your new self crosses that finishing line, your old self hasn't even got to the halfway point. And when you present things to children in these terms, um, it creates a profound impact on their self-belief and it helps to create this growth mindset, which is so important um, for their academic careers and indeed lives in general. So there we go, whistle stop tour of the training series. Um, I'll now attempt to, uh, I'll end the show and see if I can get back on um, stopping the screen share. There we go, I'm back. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts or comments or questions? Um, I've, no I'm sorry, um, I have no questions, but I do love the entire idea of like, it's colorful and bright, so kids could like really love it. Fantastic, uh, thank you. Thank you, Srija. Um, yeah, so, uh, Vargis, we've spoken. So, Srija, where are you based? Um, Buckinghamshire. Buckinghamshire, okay. And are you, are you, are you, are you an A-level student at the moment? I am, year 12. Okay, fantastic. How's that going? Um, a little stressful. I take four A-levels, so... Yeah, I can imagine. It's a long time ago for me, but it, it is a pretty stressful time. How about you, Shainala? Where are you speaking from? Uh, I'm currently in Cardiff, and I did my master's in English literature. I graduated in November. Okay, all right. Um, all right, guys, very good. So if, if no one's got any uh, further questions, um, then I will end the webinar there. And... Tomorrow, I will uh, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the the tutoring model, okay? So what the company will do. And I'm gonna go into uh, a few more specifics on the books, just in terms of how to use them with students uh, and how to get the most out of them. So um, are you all able to attend again tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. All right, fantastic. Yes. So I look forward to seeing you then, same time, same place. Um, and uh, until then, have a great day. Great. You too. See you tomorrow. Okay, take care. Bye.